Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for December 4th, 2023. It's the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff, or Jepler, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is sponsored primarily by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold this meeting in the CircuitPython Dev Text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. But uh, we've got people in almost all world time zones, so if you just want to show up and talk about Adafruit pertinent stuff, uh, we welcome you anytime. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time, those are American time zones, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, there's usually two or three a week, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. I mentioned a notes document that accompanies the recording. If you're watching this after the fact, the link is down in the show notes and includes timestamps so you can skip to the part of the video that interests you the most. This meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, after each meeting, we post a link to the next meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython Dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. You can find it by going to the pinned messages list, and then you can add your notes at any time during the week before the following meeting. And of course, uh, if you wish to participate but uh, can't attend live, you can leave your hug reports and status updates, and the host will read them out during the meeting. This meeting is held in multiple parts. Next up is Community News, a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a chosen set of items from our Python on Microcontrollers newsletter, which now also comes out on Mondays. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, a quantitative overview of the whole project, a chance to look at things by the numbers separate from status updates. Then we get to the first of our round robin parts called Hug Reports. It's an opportunity to highlight the good things people are doing and take the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. Fourth is status updates. It's an opportunity for you to report on what you've been up to. We invite you to take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing in the week since our last meeting and what you plan to get up to over the next week. And the fifth and final part is called in the weeds. If anything merits a long, more long form discussion, this is the place for it. That can result uh, from something during status updates that is uh, taking longer than anticipated or something that you identify ahead of time as uh, needing more of a group discussion format rather than a report. And that covers how the meeting will go. So I'm gonna head over to the notes document, scroll up to community news and tell you about some of this cool stuff in our newsletter. So first up, Eben Upton hints at an RP2040 successor and promises a Raspberry Pi Compute Module 5 in 2024. Uh, and there is a link in the notes doc to hackster.io. And I think that uh, review has been published in a couple of places. Uh, and here's a quote, we know what people don't like and what people do like, and we have a chip team. All right, next up, this is a new one on me, NanoPy, a new Python for programming microcontrollers. Oxon AG in Switzerland has renamed OxoPy to NanoPy and are touting it to program microcontrollers. NanoPy is a simple and clear scripting language that both beginners and experienced users can quickly get to grips with. It is used in microcontroller projects, for example, for smart homes, educational and gaming computers, or automation and robotics projects. NanoPy masters the well-known Python style or can be programmed even more simply in a more compact form without colons and fewer brackets. And uh, speaking as myself again, I did take a look at their website uh, today, and it's a language that is uh, like similar to Python in style, but the notes say that it is a statically typed language, uh, which is different than Python uh, and different than CircuitPython. So that's very interesting, and it's interesting that they wanted to kind of choose a Python layout for their programs, but I don't think it's I don't think it tries to hew as close to standard Python as CircuitPython and MicroPython do. So I wish them uh, all the luck in their project. Anyway, 
These are just a couple of items from the Python on Microcontrollers weekly newsletter. And the Python on Microcontrollers weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Monday. The complete archives are at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with the changes. Links are in the uh, notes doc. You may also email cpnews at adafruit.com or tag a post with hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon, Blue Sky, or X, formerly known as Twitter. And Anne says, please tell folks about the newsletter. It's free to subscribe with no ads or spam. Yeah. Um, so that wraps us up for the newsletter, or at least this tiny little view of the newsletter. So next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. We uh, use our Adabot to run a report of the last seven days of activity. This runs sometime in the early hours on Monday morning. And uh, yeah, reports on approximately seven days of activity. So over that time, we had 35 pull requests merged from 20 authors and seven reviewers. And uh, I failed to highlight the, the new or less frequent contributors. So let me just scan through this list real quick. M. Rangan, Tristan Warder, Uberi, WizDPI, King Feru, R. Grizel, and some of the others are less familiar to me, so I want to say a big thank you to them. Uh, while some of us are able to do this um, kind of as a day job, it is also wonderful when people just with an interest uh, help make things better for everybody. So thank you very much. And reviewers, we had seven reviewers. In addition to the Adafruit people, um, I also want to thank Bill88T uh, for your reviews this week. And issues-wise, we had 28 closed issues by 10 people and 22 open by 19 people. So uh, just overall, it's really a nice number of pull requests uh, merged, as well as a wide range of authors, uh, reviewers, and people interacting on issues. We're also down a little bit on issues, so that's always heartening to see. And that wraps it up for the top line statistics. And next, I've asked Dan to tell us the statistics on the core today. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So in the past week, we had 18 pull requests merged by 11 authors. As um, Jeff mentioned, some new one, new names. That's great. Uh, with DPI, Henri Clinton, and Nogman, I see. There were five reviewers. And now there are 18 open pull requests, which is a nice number that's getting smaller. Um, a few of them are really old because they're awaiting other things. Um, in the past week, there were 12 issues uh, that were closed by five people and 13 opened by 10 people. So that's staying about the same. There are 662 open issues right now. There are eight active milestones, which is how we keep track of what needs to be done by when. There are two issues open for the 10.00 version, which is now uh, strictly a figment of our imagination. But those are things that we'll need to change when 10 comes out. Um, usually it's removing deprecated features. There's one open issue left after 8.2.x. We Just to interject here, uh, Scott and Jeff and I had a triage meeting where we um, cleaned up some of the open issues and moved them around. So the number of open issues for 8.2.x went down to only one issue now. Um, there are now only 41 open issues for 9.00. There were more like 50 or 60 before that. Um, there are seven issues open for 9.xx. So some of the ones that were for 9.00, we pushed forward and we pushed a few of them to long term. There are 23 open issues having to do with libraries, 563 for long term things, 14 which are support, which means we're not sure that there are bugs. Uh, or it's obvious that it's somebody who's just uh, needing support with a particular issue. And there are 10 issues that are third party issues that are dependent on something that is beyond our control right now. And there are three issues not assigned a milestone, but we probably triage those already. Okay, and that's it for the core. 
Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up, Tim will take us on a tour of the libraries. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, this section covers all of the CircuitPython libraries, which are the Python layer of code. All these libraries live on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore and then uh, some library name. Um, across all of those libraries this week, we had 14 pull requests merged. Uh, from nine authors. Uh, a couple of the names that were newer or less frequent, uh, to me at least, were um, Tristan Warder, Uberi, uh, R. Grizzle. Uh, so thanks to those folks. Uh, and I'll say uh, also for the uh, less frequent uh, contributors, it's really nice to see uh, Jerry as well. Hope you're doing well, Jerry. Uh, nice to see uh, you pop up in here as well. Um, for those PRs, we had uh, six reviewers, uh, which is mostly the usual team, but uh, I'll say uh, shout out to Brent this week for popping in to do some CircuitPython re reviews. Uh, Brent's, Brent's been over in uh, Whippersnapper IoT land, so it's also nice to see Brent pop up. Um, the list of merged pull requests is here in the notes doc if you'd like to take a look at it. Of those um, that were merged this week, the oldest one was 122 days old, and the newest one was brand new at just one day. Uh, that leaves us with 57 pull requests that are remaining open. Uh, and also we have, uh, for the week, we had 12 uh, issues that were closed and seven new ones opened by seven people, which leaves us with 688 open issues. And of those, there are 19 of them that are labeled good first issue. Uh, you can find those 19 as well as lots of other helpful information over on circuitpython.org slash contributing if you are interested in getting involved with CircuitPython. Uh, you want to help contribute code or reviews, uh, time, effort, testing, anything like that, head over to circuitpython.org slash contributing. Um, this is going to uh, allow you to contribute on the Python side of things. Uh, on that page, what you're going to find is a list of the open pull requests and open issues. Uh, over on the issues side is where you can find the filter for the good first issues. If you're interested in getting started with reviewing, check out the open PRs. Uh, take a look at any code there, uh, even for things like uh, spelling and uh, you know just basic information uh, in the code. You can try it out if you've got the hardware. Um, if you are wanting to do some coding yourself, check out the list of issues and find something that you've got some hardware for or have an interest in trying to tackle. Um, again, good first issue is one of the things you can filter out on that page. There are a handful of other uh, filters if you like to get involved in there. Um, there is a guide for contributing to CircuitPython with Git and GitHub. So if you are uh, new and have not experienced Git or GitHub before, don't worry. We have a guide that can walk you through uh, getting your code uh, contributed and merged in. Uh, as well as the guide, there's also plenty of helpful folks around on the Discord. So you can join us uh, on Discord to get help from folks um, throughout the week as well. Because uh, uh, as always, we want to help you contribute in whatever way is best for you. Um, uh, the last bit of stats for the libraries uh, this week is over on the PyPy side of things. These are the, the PyPy download stats um, across all of our libraries. Uh, the total this uh, week was 114,613 downloads uh, on PyPy. The, the top 10 list is listed out here uh, with mostly the, uh, the usual suspects, although many uh, MQTT and uh, a couple others, DHT, are some that I don't think we see in there. Um, most typically. Uh, there's also a list here if you want to take, them, uh, take a look at them of the libraries that were updated, including a couple of the new libraries over in the uh, community bundle, like the LilyGo T deck. Uh, let's see, what is this one? The P1AM uh, 200 helpers. Uh, those are new libraries over in the uh, community bundle, uh, as well as a list of updated ones here as well. Um, so take a look at those if you'd like. And that's what we've got for libraries this week. Thanks. Thank you. That was a couple of mouthfuls. Uh, to round out this section, maker Melissa is going to tell us about Blinka statistics. Uh, <clears throat> Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had three pull requests merged by two authors and one reviewer. There are currently seven open pull requests amongst all the repositories. There were four closed issues by one person and two opened by two people, leaving a net of 79 open issues. There were 13,921 PyPI downloads in the last week. 
7,679 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 126 supported boards. And that's it. Thank you, Melissa. And now it is time to start the participatory stuff in the meeting, which is the best parts. Uh, we will go on to Hug Reports. As I mentioned before, uh, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list in the document order, which we try to keep alphabetical, but you know, no problem if it's not, uh, and give everybody a chance to participate. If you're text only or missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. All right, and here we go. So I have a group hug for all y'all, and I specifically want to thank Dan and Scott for uh, the organizing or triaging of the 900 bug list. We need to make that list tractable and then uh, get to work on it. And finally, Katni, thanks for chatting last week. I really appreciate you staying in touch. And next up is Dan. Okay, hold on. I've lost track of my... Um... Okay, so um, thanks to uh, Scott for noticing that ESP IDF 5.1.2 uh, has dynamic services, which is something we were waiting for for BLE. We thought we'd have to do it ourselves. So this is for Espressive BLE. Um, thanks to uh, Katni for a nice catch-up conversation, as you, as you did also, Jeff. Thanks to ADCC, who is continuing to investigate the macOS Sonoma problem which delays writes to the CircuitPython drive. Uh, he was able to instrument um, the writes on the CircuitPython side to see which metadata and data writes were happening when, and it was extremely helpful. And thanks to Scott and Jeff for the triage meeting we had about 8.2.x and 900 bugs. All right. Thank you. Next up is DJ Devon 3. Thank you. Uh, I, I just have hugs for Anecdata and Justin for helping to troubleshoot an Adafruit issues request. Um, a hug to Foamy Guy for reviewing some PRs that I submitted and Vladik for reviewing a PR. And he had some really good feedback on some changes. And that's it. Thank you. Next, I have notes from uh, David Glode, who can't make it today, but sends a group hug. And next is Foamy Guy. All right, uh, hug reports for me this week, thanks to DigiDevin3, uh, who's been helping out lots of folks over on Discord in the Help With channel. Um, thanks to Dexter, who has done some really nice testing and reviewing of some work that I'm doing inside Circup, and a group hug for everybody. Thanks. Great. Uh, next is Maker Melissa. I had a hug for you, Jeff, for a nice uh, chat to catch up on things, and group hug to everyone else. Thank you. I I was going to thank you, but then I wasn't sure if it was two weeks ago and I didn't actually check. So, yes, I'll report right back at you. And next up is Scott, also known as Tan Newt. Hello. <clears throat> First, a hug uh, to you, Jeff, for filling in for me and Liz recently for meetings we weren't able to do. A uh, hug to Jeff again and Dan for the 9.0 issue prioritization. Hug to Foamy Guy for the web workflow support in Circup and the library wrangling. And lastly, to Maker Melissa for all of the Pi 5 work and support. Uh, it's it's a lot of work to have a bunch of people come with a shiny new thing and expect everything to just work. <laughs> so thank you, Melissa, for taking that all on. And to round out this section, I've got some notes from Toddbot, who uh, is text only. Uh, Toddbot writes, group hug. Thanks, everyone, for making SirPi such a nice platform. It's so much more rational than the others I use and one for Tanute for USB host on RP2040 and U Adafruit USB host MIDI. It's a great start to what will be huge for reusing all those cheap USB MIDI controllers as UI devices for projects. And I want to second on that one because um, I have a MIDI keyboard that I would like to use with CircuitPython. That wraps up Hug Reports, and that brings us to the status updates. That's our time to tell folks what we've been up to individually. I'll start and we'll go through the list in document order. When I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you plan on doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide quick tips and tricks, but if a discussion becomes uh, at all long, we'll want to move it from status updates to in the weeds. 
Uh, and with that, I will get started. So um, I'm kind of in a yak shaving mode and I'm gonna do this from the inside out. So uh, in CircuitPython build tools, I've got an open PR that adds support for including arbitrary binary files with uh, packages, which is any library that has a directory structure. The, this relies on metadata in the file called pyproject.toml, and we never checked that data before. If the library was also published on PyPI, it would have been checked, um, but it, this is new for CircuitPython build tools. So, of course, it didn't work with all the libraries. I made a list of all the libraries that didn't work right. They are mostly in the community bundle. In the CircuitPython build tools change, I have a blacklist so that this uh, doesn't need to hold back incorporating the PR because um, folks in the community bundle are honestly are obviously not um, necessarily going to respond as quickly to an issue uh, as we would like in order to incorporate this change into CircuitPython build tools. Um, so for that to be ready, I need to make one last check that the contents of the bundle are unchanged before and after my changes so we aren't, uh, for instance, failing to package files that we should have packaged up. Um, so that is to enable some things with the CircuitPython library that we're calling PyCam, which is for an upcoming camera product. Uh, I've reorganized it so that the firmware for the autofocus feature of the camera can be bundled inside the library rather than copied into all of the examples. And I added a mode tentatively called G-Boy because it's inspired by the Game Boy camera, which um, shows a one bit black and white dithered version of the, the camera image and then can save that to a GIF on your SD card. Uh, once that's done, then I still need to add it to the bundle, add it to PyPI and add it to read the docs. Um, the next thing I've got as a um, iron in the fire is JPEG IO. I have started a skeleton implementation of JPEG decoder. It is going to take a JPEG from an in-memory buffer and output it to an RGB 565 bitmap in memory. And initially this is just going to work on the Espressif family microcontrollers that have JPEG code uh, in their ROM, but we are choosing, uh, this is a, also a library that's open source, so we will potentially be able to incorporate that same library on other microcontrollers uh, within the Flash. Um, but the goals are all relative to uh, two kind of products, which is the Qualia. We'd like to decode JPEG images and display them on an LCD or a dot clock display or whatever from CircuitPython. And for the camera, we'd like to, for instance, um, display an image, like review an image on the viewfinder, which is a common uh, feature of digital cameras. And doing that, like actually from the JPEG would be the most obvious way. Anyway, um, and let's see, I'll just delete that item because we don't need to talk about that. Um, and anyway, in personal news, I got a resin 3D printer, the Elegoo Mars 3 Pro, which is actually quite an entry level printer. I have had some initial success. My project that I really want to do is to print uh, keycaps for all of my homemade keyboards, but I've kind of had a string of disappointments and failed prints since then. And dealing with uncured resin, which is basically hazardous waste, is quite a chore. So I'm not sure I recommend it. I'll keep playing with it, but uh, it's it's been a little bit up and down. And yeah, just dealing with the goo is kind of unpleasant. So with that, I will hand things off to Dan. What's up? Okay, so I'm still working on A2X and 90 bugs. As I mentioned, we had a triage meeting. And so that was really helpful because we got rid of some bugs and we filled each other in on our hints about what's wrong, might be wrong. So we have more direction about what to work on and hints of what what might be wrong for the bugs that we're still trying to work on. And I'll probably work on some more releases soon. There's nothing that's really imminently uh, shippable, but there are a number of small changes for both the A2X and the uh, 900 um, branches. And so we'll um, probably, maybe later this week or maybe early next week or something, we'll see what, what we're waiting for and whether we should delay until some significant thing gets changed. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next is DJ Devon3. Thank you. 
Uh, last week, I spent an entire week troubleshooting an issue with Adafruit requests running out of sockets. Ultimately ended up being a self-inflicted wound using session inside the main loop, which will absolutely lead to out-of-socket errors. And thanks to Anik Data and Justin, who spent a pretty, the better part of a night w with me and the next day helping me to troubleshoot that one. Um, so they put in considerable effort, so they deserve uh, hugs for those. Uh, I started adding some touchscreen GUI features to my Featherweather project using the Adafruit button library instead of tab layouts because uh, it's just easier to go with the buttons. Um, so instead of sleeping for 15 minutes between polling, it's now using the, those 15 minutes to search for button presses or touchscreen presses. And I'd like to get to build a, a menu system capable of changing the SSID and password using only the touchscreen. That way I can give that to a relative and they don't have to hook it up to USB or anything like that in order to change the, the Wi-Fi and SSID. Um, so that, I think that would be a nifty feature to add. Uh, submitted a couple PRs that were approved and merged this week. The updated Twitch API example for Adafruit requests has already helped one person in Discord after Twitch's recent API breaking changes. If you attempt to use their old API, you will be greeted with a JSON message that simply says, gone. Which is kind of funny. I've never seen something like that. Uh, the change breaks at least two Adafruit Learn Guides for live on-air projects using the Twitch API. So this is... You add a fruit folks notice that your Twitch API learn guides have been broken. And that's all I got. All right. Next, I have notes from David, who uh, writes, Weeks of doorbell-related activity, non-CircuitPython part. Modified a wireless doorbell by adding, by adding a bodge wire to the button PCB in order to press the button from a relay. Acquired a made-for-ESP home smart doorbell. There's a link in the notes doc. Installed Home Assistant and ESP Home add-on. With ESP Home, in a few clicks, you go from a YAML file describing the hardware to flashing the firmware, a bit like CICD IoT infrastructure as code. Change the YAML file to make a doorbell with 10 seconds of delay between button press and activation. Notice ESP Home device can work standalone, in my case, with Home Assistant protocol or MQTT. And then there's the CircuitPython part of the doorbell project. Doorbell song. Turn a Feather RP2040 prop maker into a Christmas song doorbell. Could I run CircuitPython on the Smart Doorbell version 3? It is using an ESP32 WA room. And the final result? A visitor presses the doorbell button and activates a relay that closes three circuits. The Christmas wave file starts playing on the prop maker. The button from the wireless doorbell is pressed, triggering one or more multi remote ringers. And 10 seconds later, our traditional loud ringer is activated by the Smart Doorbell version 3. Sounds like a cool, progress, a cool project. Next is ADCC. Hello. Hello. So I did more tracing on the Sonoma problem, or problem last week and produced what I hope to be the definitive trace of the problem. Um, and sadly, I also determined that greater than eight megabyte file systems don't actually resolve the underlying problem. And that's the late writing of the directory and fat table entries. Um, I've added both traces to the issue. Um, also, I've um, put the tracing code on a branch. Um, so that's easily accessible at my uh, uh, GitHub. And uh, early tracing results for iOS indicate that it is not affected, but uh, tracing iOS is a bit problematic. Um, I think I'll have a clearer trace later this week. And that's it. Thank you. That's very highly technical stuff that uh, I think most people would shy away at taking on. So really excited to see that info coming in. Next up is Tim. All right, uh, over the past week, I've been continuing to work on uh, Circup Web workflow uh, refactoring. Um, as part of that, I noticed uh, Scott made some improvements in the web workflow, so I went and grabbed the latest and greatest build and tested that out alongside of it. Um, I did get stuck for a while uh, because I managed to fill up the storage on my device, so I had a bit of a, a facepalm moment where I was not being able to do anything because I actually just had uh, no room left on my device, but eventually we made it uh, past that and um, have kept going. 
I did some uh, other reviews and testing on um, submissions for mini MQTT and request libraries. Um, outside of CircuitPython, I've been enjoying the challenges for Advent of Code uh, 2023, as well as TryHackMe's Advent of Cybersecurity. Um, I've had lots of fun solving the challenges that have popped up so far, and it got me thinking about potentially uh, trying to make a CircuitPython-based Advent um, event for next year. I'm curious to see if anyone else is interested in something like that, especially if uh, there's any people interested in helping to write challenges or helping to write story um, or people who are perhaps interested in participating. Um, feel free to reach out and I'll um, gauge interest on that. Um, and the uh, other thing that I have gotten into uh, this morning was running the patch with Adabot in order to fix an issue for the Sphinx builds, um, specifically inside Read the Docs. And it also unpins Sphinx in the same uh, change. And then I have been working through the ones that were not able to go automatically. There was uh, a couple of them that the patch didn't apply to because the, there were slight variations in the file. And then there were a couple that um, didn't push because there are different permissions on the repo. So I've been working through those. Uh, and I'll put together a list of all of the repos that have um, different configuration as well. Um, and that is what I've got for now. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, it's maker Melissa. Hello. So last week I worked on, um, I updated the Qualia guide with Backlight Info, Arduino library installation, and another example. I worked on the Qualia helper library guide, and I worked on some GitHub issues and PRs. This week, uh, see, I, while I was working on the uh, Qualia helper library guide, I found a bug in CircuitPython that seems to have introduce then introduce sometime between alpha 2 and alpha 5 which causes an intermittent delay in reading capacitive touches that i need to narrow down some more um and then i need to finish up the qualia library guide and i need to add the bar displays to the qualia guide and qualia library and then take um, another look at some of the raspberry pi issues and that's where i'm at all right sounds like a full plate Next, I have a note from Paul Cutler, who uh, writes, The new episode of the CircuitPython show is out today, featuring Max Lupo. Max shares how he uses CircuitPython in his art pieces and installations. Next is Scott. Hello, thanks, Jeff. Uh, <clears throat> I updated the ESP IDF to 5.1.2, uh, merged in, hoping it fixes some issues, and also just kind of wanting to do some churn before we start to stabilize 9.0. And Dan suggested I look at the release notes and I noticed uh, pretty quickly that it includes uh, the support for dynamic BLE services, which is what uh, blocked me when I was originally adding BLE support to ESP. Uh, so that's super exciting, but I'm not letting myself get distracted. So we should be unblocked on the espresso side, which is really cool. Um, so I'm circling back. I was working on making SD cards available over the web workflow. Um, this is kind of like a subtask of getting uh, file sizes showing up or, or free space sizes showing up in the like basic uh, file manager. Um, and then there's a number of bugs that, uh, for the ESP for 9.0 that I'm going to look at later. Um, my mom, who is sick, is going to be staying at our house Wednesday and probably Thursday nights as well. So uh, I may not be around as much uh, when she's over because it's important to spend time with her. And that's my week. Thank you, Scott. And last up, I have a note from Toddbot, who writes, Fun Hobby this month is doing adventofcode.com in Python. Mostly CircuitPython compatible Python, since that's what I know. And that rounds up status updates. The next section is in the weeds. And our first and only topic is from Justin. So take it away, Justin. Yeah, thanks. I'm so excited to be here. I've been using um, stuff from Adafruit for a really long time. I've been a Python developer for a long time. And finally got to the point where I'm switching over and starting to do a lot of work in CircuitPython, which I'm loving and trying to just help out where I can. And so, you know, as DJ Devon3, you know, noted, you know, he was struggling with an issue and we spent quite a bit of time kind of looking into it. And it just started making me think, right? So if we're gonna, you know, we have this, you know, very limited architecture that we can use. And 
lots of new users who aren't going to necessarily realize that you know things like requests and MQTT and things like that are all going to you know use the sockets a little bit different and everything like that and had the thought of you know is there a way to make a more generic session library that would then allow everything and even additional things that people add um, to connect to the internet through our, your guys' devices and other devices um, to kind of use a shared pool and really kind of track what's going on as opposed to them being separate. Um, often when I've done things in um, shared environments like Adafruit and things, you know, you go open up a pull request and then the people that are reviewing it have a particular structure or different thought processes. And so before just kind of digging into something and spending a lot of time to build something, I kind of wanted to get feedback and see if this was a good idea, a way that Adafruit wanted to go um, and CircuitPython wanted to go with, you know, kind of making some of these things kind of simpler. Um, so that's kind of my high level pitch and would love to hear some thoughts and comments. And um, maybe there's other places this is already going that I don't know about. Uh, the first thing that I'm thinking of is like, with the new memory changes it, that we just did in 9.0, it might be possible for us to just support more dynamic sockets. Um, I haven't looked in great detail. Uh, that's only on Espressif. Um, but it's, I don't know, it sounds like reusing sockets is, you're talking about creating a shared library for managing reusing sockets, and, and that is less important if we can just have more of them. Um, but I haven't really looked into that as well. Uh, generally, I like the idea of splitting things out uh, and sharing it, but memory use is also a, a thing to think about. I, I like the idea because I keep running into issues where if, if you put the wrong line in in a while true loop and it starts failing, the the errors are not generally helpful. So it'd be nice if if it does it all, like within Adafruit requests or or in mini MQTT, where it can handle all the exceptions and gracefully fail, because it doesn't do that right now. You have to add, manually add in your exception handlers in your script, and then your script gains like, you know, 200 lines just trying to get the thing to gracefully fail and reiterate over and over and over. So I'd like to see that kind of thing built into the library to make it easier. And I'm sure that was the original intent, but it just doesn't quite work. Well, that sounds like something separate to what I assume Justin was talking about. It, it is, but I think that kind of thing needs to be part of, of that. And, and I would totally agree with that. And I'm all for a very stepped approach, right? Like not just changing the way requests works today, but slowly adding things and, you know, kind of doing it small pieces at a time. I love small PRs that people can review versus this like huge, like, oh, we just changed how we do sessions and, you know, error handling and things like that. Um, like other random things having there is like using, you know, context and things like that. And so, you know, even if you do use it in the loop, it automatically cleans itself up and mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about like the self-replacing and everything like that. Um, mm -hmm. And potentially even some updated documentation to say, even right now with requests, make sure to, you know, initiate your request session at the very top of your file and never do it again, right? Like there's a lot of mm -hmm. low-hanging fruit that could kind of go through this process of changing requests and making it a little bit more user-friendly for, you know, newer people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm all for that, and I really appreciate you coming here and, and asking about it up front, like you said. <laughs> like, um, I definitely don't feel, I think, you know, I, request has a long, Adafruit request has a long history because it started from MicroPython code, and then I did a lot of work on it at some point as well. I don't feel particularly attached to it, so feel free to, um, to improve it with the caution that I think after the session is created, it should work the same as like the, the regular Python requests. Um, and I think that's, a, I think there's a challenge about where the boundary for error, network error handling is, and that could be part of it. Um, 
which is really tricky. <laughs> yeah, like, and I agree. And I'm I've used regular Python requests for very long, right. so I'm super familiar with that. And I definitely wouldn't want to, you know, love to be at how things were. You know, someone writes a library for regular Python, and it's super easy to port over. You know, right. because request works the same way, and so that type of thing is right. really important to me. Um, so yeah, and that's yeah, usually the. Yeah, that's usually the barrier where I'll like pump the brakes on people's work. It's like, wait, 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 wait. Like, you're you're making this super custom, and now you're breaking compatibility with C Python. So that that's a big no no for me. But if you can work within those parameters, that's it's fine. Um, I just want to read a note from Anic Data as well. It says, says it's been a recurring support issue when multiple socket using network libraries are used in a project. Each reserves one or a set of sockets independently, depleting the limited supply. Um, yeah. but, and, and that's kind of the exact thing I'm trying to tr figure out a way to alleviate, you know, and so mm -hmm. if they're all using one, you know, one major, you know, handler that goes through and knows, okay, this is when one's been released and whatnot. And mm -hmm. so now I can grab it. Um, and I even saw, you know, some examples of, you know, finding out how many sockets are available still, like potentially even building some of that stuff in as well, so people could look and even test before they connect. Do I actually have a socket available um, right. before I even try to connect to something? So, really, just trying to streamline. So, um, hmm. so from what I'm hearing, sounds like I'm good to go to start working on something on a high level, um, and then you know, open a first level PR or something and get some high level you know comments on it. And if you know, people think it looks good, just kind of run with it. Yeah, and early, early and often, uh, as you're doing already, is great. Um, yeah, the only other thing I would say is, like, there, there hasn't been a lot of work done to see if we can't just have more sockets. <laughs> um, so that, that is something worth considering as well, um, is just trying to, to tune internally how many sockets we can support. Um, but with that, I still see the issue, right? Kind of like, I forgot who mentioned it, right? Ran out of hard drive space, right? Like, no matter how high you make that number, right. you know, potentially, you know, yep. unoptimized code will still hit that limit at some point. Right, right. And we're all about good error messages, too. So if you can improve error messaging and stuff, be really proactive or suggesting really proactive things for folks, that's great. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. I I have a script that has, that runs through seven different APIs in one script, um, and it worked when I wrote it. Um, so you're free to try and use that um, because that one is a juggernaut. It just goes through seven different APIs. Twitter has since broken. Twitch has since broken. <laughs> That's the one bad thing about working with APIs is their APIs can change and break at any second. That's very true. Yeah, if you can send me which one that is, I've seen some of your stuff, but if you can help direct me to which one that is, I'd happy to kind of use that as a benchmark. Does anyone happen to know um, in the core implementation of our socket pool, does our socket object have a finalizer so that when it becomes garbage, it will be closed and release all those resources? And if not, is that something we need to add? I don't know. I haven't looked enough into it. I know one of the issues specifically is like the way the fruit request session works is when it finishes, it calls close, but then it actually doesn't close. It holds it open, which it should because it's for request, right? In case you try to hit the same site again. But then if that particular thing is like re-initted, all of that data is lost at that point, um, you know, which is the issue that um, DJ Devon 3 was having. Um, so I know there's some places that do some automatic cleanup, but potentially not all places. So that would definitely be a place I would go look into and see, um, which may potentially even be digging into some of the C code as well. I don't think Socket Pool does that. Do you think that would be a good addition? Um, so Socket Pool doesn't actually reuse sockets. So it might be that just sockets need to close automatically. But yeah, there's certainly a world where we're not, well, that we're leaking sockets is possible. Yeah, I was just imagining that 
like what assuming that say dj devon's code wasn't keeping around 100 session objects but ha only had one at a time and the other session should have been an object that could be gc collected um mm -hmm. making sure that that actually freed the socket objects could make it able to limp along uh it still wouldn't be ideal code it'd be great if we could offer people a better way of structuring their code but the discussion made me wonder if there was something like a finalizer missing that could improve things that's all yeah. there was will, i'll definitely dig into that like that was one of my questions that i hadn't passed when we were troubleshooting to see if a garbage collect would fix anything and so i will definitely that, add that to my list that was one of the changes that i made was i removed the garbage collection from the script and then it started failing i was doing too much too fast but the garbage collection i think was working and then when I explicitly tried to close the sockets, they were they were not closing without GC. Uh, I don't know why. Um, yeah. All right. Um, it let's... looks like socket pool does have is registered with a finalizer, but I'm not sure it actually is hooked up. <laughs> okay. Um, so Justin, if you don't mind uh, summarizing like any of the things that that folks said that they didn't write in the document. Um, just as we continue and close out the meeting, that would be helpful. Um, and then otherwise, I will take us to the wrap up section. So this has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for December 4th, 2023. If you want to, uh, thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast is available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific as usual. That's Monday, December 11th. Um, it is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonista's role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everybody.